Excellent! Hello everyone and welcome back to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series. This is episode number 45 for February 2020. Thanks to all of you who have been bearing with me this month since I haven't been posting as many videos as usual, but uh, trying to get back into the swing of the things and I think it's still February. Should still be February since we get extra February this year. And if you want to check out the old Probing Pauls, there's a look down the, the Probing Paul hole. I thought it was funny, it seems to get mistier as you go further down the hole, that, that's kind of interesting. If you'd like me to answer your question though, leave it in the comment section down below and potentially I will answer it next month. So let's get right into it. Here's the first question from Falconite Films who says, love the channel and the series in particular. Thank you very much. Uh, how often would you recommend upgrading your PC when it becomes un unable to run newer titles? Should I preemptively upgrade before this becomes an issue? A good question, sort of a, a universal question when it comes to PC building is how often should you upgrade? And there's a reasonable answer that's like, hey, it depends on a lot of factors and who you are and how much money you have and what PC you currently have, uh, what's coming out, what's launching on the markets. But uh, I'm gonna brush all that aside and I'm just gonna give you a straight up answer. Three years, every three years, you should look into upgrades. All right, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to be more specific, there is more that goes into it than that. And of course, uh, how much money you have is certainly a factor in how much money you wanna spend on something like a PC. I find that every three years or so is a pretty good time frame because it's about that long before you have hardware upgrades that are available that will typically provide you with a significant, noticeable, demonstrable performance jump from stuff that was three years plus older. Now again, that's not universal because it depends on the launch cycle of certain things. And if you look, for example, at the Intel side right now, looking at what's available now versus three years ago, uh, isn't that much of a difference. And that's because Intel's been kind of stuck on 14 nanometer for a while, and they're only getting real performance boosts by, by increasing the frequency of their processors. And there's only so much you can do in that range. Now, if you're a regular viewer of my channel, I tend to recommend building your own system so you can choose your own parts. And in that case, I think you're in sort of a different place than someone who's considering, I have a computer now, I need to upgrade to a completely new computer. Because I usually recommend building systems that have an upgrade path. And if you have an upgrade path, well, it's not about replacing or upgrading your entire PC. It's about, hey, I have a graphics card that I bought two years ago for $200 if I upgrade to a graphics card that's available now for $300, that'd probably be a pretty significant bump because you're looking at uh, two-year-old hardware versus current hardware, and you're looking at spending a little bit more money. All that is to say there's many variables that go into answering that question, but uh, if you wanted just a straightforward single answer, uh, three years, that's what I go with. Next question here from Hanging Tom. Hey Paul, when it comes to features on motherboards today, what are some new features people overhype what are some that should be given more credit? So to answer the first part of your question, uh, features that people overhype, and I don't know if these get overhyped too much, but yeah, RGB. RGB absolutely gets uh, a lot of hype and people are interested in it because it's a great way to customize your system and to make it flexible throughout the year, for example, like uh, my Arctic Panther build back there, I changed the color with the seasons, at least that's what I've been doing for the past year or two. Going beyond that, a lot of newer products have like LCD screens with readouts on them that can tell you information about stuff. And like, that's kind of cool and everything, but honestly, if it's something that could just be displayed on your monitor, which you're probably gonna be looking at a little bit more frequently than staring at your computer, I find those to be less usable or less useful, especially when the motherboards that feature them tend to cost like $300 or more. If you wanna know what features I actually really like and look for, uh, I actually have a video on that, so I'll direct you to that. It's a couple years old, but it's still very, very much what I would say if you were asking what the actual useful, usable features on a motherboard are. I will link this in the description, but uh, I'll also run over them really quick for you here. One is surface mounted power and reset buttons. I find those to be useful in multiple situations, if not not just when doing an outside of the box build. Debug LEDs will give you much more detailed information about what's going on while your system is booting up. And if you are having any issues with any anywhere along the way, it will typically freeze at a certain code and you can look up that code and you can get a much better idea of what you might need to fix or change 
uh, by referencing the debug LED codes, which are typically in the product's manual. Another one is the ability to flash your UEFI or BIOS without having a CPU or memory installed. This can be really helpful on systems that might have been bricked or had a power outage during a UEFI update. In particular, more recently for all of the Ryzen motherboards that have come out, Ryzen has 300 series and 400 series motherboards that were compatible with 1000 series, 2000 series, and 3000 series Ryzen CPUs. But if the motherboard came out before the CPU launched, then the motherboard needs a UEFI or BIOS update in order to recognize the new CPU. To avoid having to bring your motherboard somewhere to a PC repair shop to do that update, uh, being able to update the UEFI without a CPU installed means you can update your motherboard on your own without having to have an old CPU to drop in there to do the update with. Another one is on the rear I.O., an exposed BIOS reset or BIOS flashing switch. Just very convenient, especially if you have a system all put together. A lot of times you need to jumper to pin on the motherboard to do that, or even sometimes there's an internal button that allows you to clear it. Uh, but often that requires accessing the motherboard directly, and if you have a complex system built on top of it, that might be a little bit difficult to do. Having it on the back of the, of the motherboard's I.O. means you can clear that if you're having any BIOS issues or messing around with overclocking without having to access the inside of your system, without having to access pinouts that can often be difficult to reach on the motherboard itself. And the last one is just generically more advanced fan controls. Fortunately, a lot of motherboards are doing this now. They allow you to actually visually pull up and see the different fans that are connected to the system, set fan curves, recognize whether it's in voltage control or PWM control mode and switch back and forth between those. Uh, those are my actual useful and not fluffy and overhyped features for motherboards uh, that I would recommend looking for. And the cool thing is, I think you can find most of these features on motherboards that cost 200 to 250-ish dollars, which to me means that the really high-end motherboards that are like three, $400 plus, I don't see a whole lot of value to, unless you just wanna have the most expensive possible system you can put together. Next question from Steve S. Uh, hey Paul, love the vids, thank you Steve. I'm building my first PC, was thinking of using a Ryzen 2700. Can't decide on a B450, X470, or X570 motherboard, and then potentially upgrading the CPU later. The Ryzen 2700 uh, is a really good processor because it's an eight core, uh, it's using 12 nanometer manufacturing process technology, which is a little bit better than the first gen 1000 series processors. They're gonna lag behind the 3000 series Ryzen processors a little bit when it comes to single core performance and maybe just a touch in gaming at lower resolutions. But getting yourself an eight core 16 thread CPU on the AM4 platform with plenty of upgrade options is really compelling for a lot of people. And I often get, I often do these videos where I'm like, hey, get the Ryzen 3600. 30, and people are like, well, what about that 2700 or 2700X? Yes, if you can find a good deal on that, and if you need more cores and threads versus a uh, faster single core performance, it's a really good processor for the money. That said, I would point you towards a B450 motherboard to slot that into because uh, most of the B450 motherboards are compatible with Ryzen 3000 series. There's really good B450 options in the $100 to $120 range, uh, the MSI B450 Tomahawk being one of those. And honestly, the main reason to get an X570 motherboard would be for forward compatibility for people PCI Express Gen 4. And the fact is, most people don't really need that unless you really need a lot of really fast storage for your particular use case, which you might, in which case, yes, go for X570, but you'll also need to upgrade your processor to have that PCIe Gen 4 compatibility in the future as well. But it seems to me like you're going for more of a bang for the buck option here with the 2700, and I think the bang for the buck option on the motherboard side with that is B450 still. Next question here from Greg Walrath, who says, thanks for all this and all you do, home projects and all. Thanks, Greg, uh, especially for the home project stuff. I got a lot of that going on right now. A question about some of your non-PC stuff. What do you use for desks? Are those IKEA desktops with legs? And also, what do you use for an external mixer? So first part of the question, what do I do for desks? And I'm assuming you're talking about my set out here. Uh, these are actually countertops. They are from Ikea. They are not desks uh, specifically, but I did use Ikea legs for them. I will link this video in the description. This is from all the way back in 2015 when I actually assembled a lot of the core set that I have going on out here. 
But yeah, just bought the countertops, bought the legs, put the legs on the bottom of the countertops. They're attached to the wall along here as well to make them a little bit more sturdy. And I've been really happy with these just because they're actually made of all solid wood. Uh, they've gotten pretty scuffed up and stuff on the top, but I feel like if I really needed to at some point, I could do a, a bit of sanding here and uh, make them nice and shiny and new again. If you're asking about the desks in my computer room though, those are actually sit stand desks. So you'll see here that this is the top, this is just an Ikea top of a desk and then the sit stand desks are motorized on the bottom. These specifically come from Monoprice and I got them through my wife because she works at Monoprice, so I bought them at cost. So I'm not directly recommending you to go to Monoprice because I am somewhat associated with them through my wife. But to be honest, these sit stand desk frames are all OEM'd, I think from about the same place in China. So they're all pretty much the same, but you can buy the, the frame itself for around usually between two and $300. They extend in the middle. So you just build up the frame and then get any uh, tabletop you want drill it in from the bottom and then you have a sit stand desk. And I really, really recommend that if you do a lot of work at your desk because it's much healthier, healthier to stand at your desk than sit or to just switch back and forth. Joe's nodding because he also has one of these sit stand desks and, and it's good, right? Good, very good. Last part of the question, uh, my mixer, it's the MG10XU. I have a video on that as well from back in 2017. I will link that in the description if you want some more info on it. Uh, and thank you very much for your question. Next up from Banana. Uh, hey Paul, your channel is great. I've been a fan since close to the end of the Newegg days. Do you have a Discord server? If so, can you link it in your channel? If not, why not? So one, uh, no, I do not have a Discord channel for me, for Paul's hardware. We do have one for awesome hardware, uh, but I don't typically go in there and spend a whole lot of time or anything. And if you wanna know why I don't have one set up, it's probably because of that. So I think here's what it boils down to for that. I often find that I am very limited on time. And I also have uh, some friends, some old friends who I feel like I haven't been catching up with or keeping in touch with as well as I could have over the years. And this year, uh, I've actually been making a bit more of a push personally to go and meet up with some of my old friends who I haven't caught up with, sit down and have dinner or lunch or something and actually talk and catch up. And I've been proud of that. So this might seem kind of a, as an aside to your question, but uh, a Discord server, people go in there and they chat or they talk in uh, chat rooms and stuff like that. And I guess for me, I wanna feel like I'm caught up with some of my old friends and stuff before I dedicate the time to do something like that as well. Maybe that sounds a little weird, but uh, it's also kind of tied into all the work that we have going on at home right now. I really feel like this year, I'm gonna get to a point where a lot of this stuff that I've had in mind, home upgrades, other projects, we're kind of getting through with. And I feel like there's gonna be a point, I really hope in the next month or two, where I can take a deep breath and be like, all right, a lot of this stuff that's been on the back burner has been accomplished. And now I have a little bit more time to look at other things. And other things in this case would mean maybe something like a Discord server, maybe spending a little bit more time gaming uh, with community members and stuff like that. Maybe reaching out for more collaborations with other YouTubers, maybe following up with uh, Jay, who I'm supposed to have gone and had lunch with or something for quite some time as well. Oh, and Awesome Hardware, our weekly live show, we've had many requests to do like a Spotify version of that or a podcast version of that, or just to translate it over to that for people who can't stream via YouTube or Twitch. Uh, so all of these things are things that I would really like to do, just need a little bit more time. So hopefully once a lot of the transitionary work stuff that's going on right now are done, I can look into something more like that. Next question from MerkFiend87. I have a probing Joe question. Joe is my editor. Uh, he also helps with many, many other things. Uh, the question though is what peripherals, special keypads, third party things do you use when editing a video? And Joe actually came in here and did some responses, but uh, since we do have the luxury of having Joe here in person, uh, maybe I can get him to slide in here and uh, see, see if he can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> what? Hi, Joe. What's up? How you doing? <laughs> what peripherals, special keypads, or third-party things do you use when editing a video? Definitely my main preferred peripheral that I love to use is my Rocket Nest mouse, and uh, you have a video on that. I edited it for you, like, what, three years ago? This is from 2015, Joe. This is five years ago. I knew it that long, or man. Four and a half. But yeah, when it comes to, like, uh, peripherals, like, uh, this thing, honestly, is like the massive time saver. Like when I first uh, edited this video, I told Paul about it and like, uh, he actually got one for me. Yeah, Rocket and, sent one over for him. Yeah, and I do appreciate that. And like, I just, 
been using that mouse ever since. And like, honestly, this thing has been a massive time saver. Um, and it's a combination of the sort of customizable side where you can put a lot of buttons and then the software as well, right? Yeah, I use all of those macros available. So like, basically when I do like my shortcuts and my keys and all that stuff, when I'm editing the cuts, the paste, the transitions or whatever, I add it all there. Not only do I like the design of this, but like the, the software itself is also pretty awesome, so. Good job on the software, right? Yeah, the swarm. So yeah, I'm like I'm a big fan of like the Rocket Nif, like the mouse, and like recently I discovered that like the keyboards that Rocket creates also they have like built-in technology where like you can use like the smart shift and then like the keys that are in your left hand area where my hand is usually yeah when I edit, they'll join it to macros. So I'm thinking about getting that as well down the line. We need to we need Rocket to send Joe a keyboard as well. Uh, also been using some other peripherals like a Logitech G13, but the software for that's kind of outdated. Yeah. Uh, trying out the Cooler Master control pad recently, but that's still sort of uh, pre-embargo for that. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably do a dedicated video on that once we're able to and talk about using it for video editing. Macros on the K95 and then uh, software wise, Red Giant Pluralize, what does Pluralize do? Pretty much like right now, Paul's using a lavalier mic, right? And pretty much like, uh, you know, screen capping. And there's times where we use multiple cameras, say like this camera, an overhead camera, or sometimes a third camera. So pretty much what this software does is it syncs up all the audio from the different sources, say from like the three cameras and like the lavalier, and it puts everything in order. That way we don't have to do that manually or do that in Premiere Pro. So, so if we're shooting a build out here or something for like three, four hours, it's just one long audio track from the lav mic, and then it takes all of those various video clips and syncs them all up with it. So pretty helpful. How do you feel having been probed for the first time? I'm comfortable with it. It's okay. It doesn't hurt as much as you'd expect it. Not my first time. <laughs> just a couple more questions. Uh, this one from Mike Goggin. Uh, appropriate, since Joe was just in here. You and Joe seem friendly with one another. Do you consider yourselves friends, or do you both maintain an employer-employee relationship? I run Paul's hardware with an iron fist. Uh, it's very, it's a very draconian sort of environment around here. I bark out orders and. Everyone, everyone follows them to the letter, or they're fired. Uh, no, I, we try to keep things pretty casual. Uh, I think Joe and I have developed a, a working relationship, a friendship, if you will, over time. Occasionally, you know, Joe oversteps his bounds, and I gotta be like, hey, cut that out, cut that out, Joe. And then occasionally, it's just, I mean, if you'd stop laughing. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> And then occasionally I get a little overwrought here, and I think Joe does a really good job of being like, hey, chill the fuck out, all right? <laughs> let's, let's bring the intensity to, uh, level down a little bit. Let's just relax and, and shoot a video and everything. So I, I, I always appreciate that. So uh, the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Kyle Buckert asks, uh, Paul, can you please grow out some thicker mutton chops and a sweet mustache? It would enhance your content times 10. So first off, the mutton chops. Uh, I, I tend I tend to keep my my sideburns, you know, a little on the longer side. I try to have just an ever so slight angle to them because that's badass, right? That's super badass. When they when they start to get puffy though, I I don't know for some reason when it starts to get that real mutton chop look, uh, I I tend to want to scale them back a little bit. But who knows? Maybe I could work on that. As for the mustache, uh, I've done the beard before with the November beard and everything. The mustache, I'm a little bit nervous about. For example, you can see here, Kyle recently in his picture of demolishing part of my house, he's sporting the mustache there, but uh, look at that response from Wifey Sauce. And I don't know, this is concerning to me because I, I enjoy having sex with my wife. Not Heather to be specific. <laughs> That's, this is getting weird. How can I phrase this more appropriately? So yeah, I, I guess if I got clearance from Mrs. Paul Hardware for that, then it's maybe something I could look into, but for the time being, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stay on the safe, safe side with that when it comes to the facial hair. And the last question here from Noob Ascending. Hey Paul, love your channel. Thank you very much, Mr. Noob. When do you think we'll get an update on the Singularity case build? Dying to see it finished. Uh, this question was asked before the most recent video on that series. That is right here. As you can see at the bottom, it's almost finished. Almost finished, so close. You can see we actually filled the loop. I got all this nonsense up here in the top right corner with the front distro plate and all that kind of worked out. So 
Right now, there's just a few very minor things to be done on it. I want to replace this uh, little bendy bend right here. It's not exactly as straight as I wanted it to, and I don't like it coming across the middle. I'm gonna kind of redo that. I got a new SLI bridge for it. So uh, shameless plug, if you want to see the final, final video on that, I do have all of the hardware needed for it right now. Just a matter of time and things got a little chaotic in the past week or two. I've mentioned that several times already in this video. So hit the subscribe button if you wanna see the final video on that. I think it's gonna be pretty exciting. I just need to dust it off because the garage got very dusty during all of the remodeling stuff. But that is the last question and that's gonna wrap it up for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And again, if you have questions for me to answer next month, which is really soon, uh, leave those down in the comments section down below. Thanks to Joe for uh, tolerating working here and everything, and we'll see you guys in the next video.